Hey folks, thanks for checking out Missio Church in Manor, Iowa. You are listening to audio recorded at our Sunday morning service. If you'd like any more information on the gospel or would like to learn more about Missio Church, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Missio Mount Air. So, my wife, I'm so thankful for her, and um, she brings things to our home that are a million amazing things that just make our home run right. Uh, And one of those things is the way that our laundry baskets are set out. So uh, we have two laundry baskets. There's even signs over the laundry baskets. And the, the signs tell us what goes in each laundry basket. However, sometimes I get it right. I've, we've been married almost 21 years now. Sometimes I get it right. A lot of times I don't get it right. And what goes in one, I do it wrong because I think, no, this is what she means by things being washed in hot water. Apparently, I have no idea what is the difference between what goes in hot water versus what goes in cold water. And my poor, exasperated wife is like, How, what do I have to do to make this easier for you? I am a repeat laundry basket offender. I confess my, my, my sin, and I'm trying to work on it, but I am very inconsistent on many things in my life. And I would imagine that there are repeat offenders in various ways and various things here. Whether it's fun things like laundry baskets or whether it's more serious things, at the end of the day, we are inconsistent people. And as we've looked through the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis, which is this amazing foundational book that that, that we've talked about over and over again, this quote from a theologian named A.W. Pink that talks about how in Genesis we find in seed form all of the major doctrines of the Bible. They're planted in this rich soil that the rest of Scripture begins to grow for us. And as we've looked at the life of Abraham, we see that there are many seeds that are continued to be planted. And so we're going to look at Genesis chapter 20 today and continue walking through the book of Genesis and continue looking at the life of Abraham. So I'm going to read for us Genesis chapter 20. If I can turn there quickly without ripping pages. So if you have your Bible, let's turn to Genesis chapter 20. And again, my pages are not cooperating. All right, so Genesis chapter 20. This is the word of God. It says, From there Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, Will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, all who are yours. 
Verse 8, so Abimelech rose early in the morning and called to his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, what have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you see that you did this thing? And Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. And she has become my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone, you are vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, and also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So if you have been tracking with us through the book of Genesis, there should be some familiarity to you with this story. Because this is not the first time that Abraham has sold his wife down the river. (laughs) Sadly, right? It is kind of like that pitiful laugh, isn't it? Like, are you serious? This is the patriarch on whom the whole thing rests, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is the second time he has thrown his wife down the river. If you remember, in Genesis chapter 12, which is one of the most important chapters in the whole of Scripture, where God comes to Abraham, then known as Abram, and God calls him to himself and says, I'm calling you to go to a land that is not your own. I'm I'm drawing you to myself. I'm making you my person, and I'm going to be your God, and I want you to go to this place because I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And this nation is going to be protected by me. This nation is going to be blessed by me. You're going to be a blessing to the nations, and anyone who comes against you, I will defend you. And then he whispers this promise, which is a seed that the rest of the scriptures unfold. He says, and oh, by the way, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. More on that in a little bit. Right after that, we see Abraham does this incredible step of faith by he gets up and he goes, not knowing exactly where he was going. He just starts going in a general direction. But right after that, There's a famine in the land that he's traveling through. So he has to leave this land called Canaan, and he goes down to Egypt because, you know, he had to go get food. And while he's in Egypt, he does the same exact thing to his wife. He walks into Egypt, and he's like, hey, my wife's kind of hot, even though she's 60. Which, hey, of course, 60-year-olds, come on now. Um... But he says, listen, you're going to tell people that you're my sister so that I'm not killed. Because if you're my wife, people are going to kill me and they're going to want to take you as their wife. And so the same thing happens. And God brings plagues on Pharaoh's house. And Pharaoh comes back and is like, take your wife back. And oh, by the way, here's some gifts because I know you belong to the one true God and I don't want him to come against me. And then he says to Abraham and Sarah, now get out of my house. (laughs) Like, get out of my land. I don't want you here. Right? But we see that this terrible moment happened. And what's sad is, is in the text of Genesis chapter 12, there is the hint that Abraham sold his wife out so much that that Pharaoh actually consummated the relationship that he had with Sarah. It's a terrible story. 
of what Abraham did in order to protect his own skin. Now, from that moment to where we are in Genesis chapter 20, 20 years or so has passed. And in that 20 years, Abraham has seen God do incredible things. One of the things that God has done is he has continued to add clarity and further revelation of what the promise that he's given to Abraham is. He repeats this covenant I made with you. I'm not giving up on it. You're going to be my people. I'm going to build a great nation out of you. He even says, look up at the stars of the sky. See how many there are. Count them if you can, because that's how many people are going to come from you, Abraham. And he renews it and says, you're mine. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you a nation. You're going to be great. You're going to be, you're, 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 you're going to be uh, someone that, that I'm going to bless the whole world through. I am going to do it. You are my person. I am your God. He has seen God provide for him. He, allowed, he watched God uh, use him to defeat four different armies in order to get some of his family back who were taken captive. He has seen God and dined with God and had amazing things happen. And so now we come to Genesis chapter 20. And Abraham has just in chapter 18, we see Abraham get some things right. He shows hospitality to God and to angels. And then God reveals to him that I'm going to go destroy and judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see this very disturbing chapter in chapter 19. But it's also a chapter that shows us that God is a judge and will not allow sin to stand. But that he will judge the wicked, but he will save the righteous. And in the middle of that, Abraham pleads with God, surely you will do what is right, God. Surely you will not, as you bring judgment down, you will not sweep the righteous away with the wicked. And we see God answer, you're right, I'm not going to sweep the righteous away with the wicked. And we see Abraham exhibit this great heart as someone who wants to pray that God will do the right thing for his good or for the good of people and, and for his own glory. And on the other side of that, we read that, that Abraham, who had not yet found a home, right? He was wandering through the land. Start Genesis chapter 20 and he has to get up and he moves again. Because he is a sojourner in this land. And he travels down into the south of the Sinai Peninsula. And then he begins to work his way back up. And he settles in this place in southeastern Canaan called Gerar. And once again, you would think this guy would learn after 20 years of walking with God. But yet he goes right back to his premeditated plan to protect his own skin forgetting everything that God had promised him, puts his wife in a, in a terrible position and puts something else in a really terrible position because what Abraham does is Abraham puts God's promise in jeopardy. If you remember, one of the primary links to the promise that God had given to Abraham is you are going to have a son. Your wife, Sarah, he says in Genesis 18, is going to have a son. And in Genesis 18, God says, a year from now, your wife, your wife, Sarah, is going to have a child that will be yours. But the second he leaves, comes into Gerar, he puts his wife in jeopardy and he puts God's promise in jeopardy by allowing another king to bring Sarah into his fold as one of his wives, as a part of his harem. Abraham once again puts his wife and God's promise in jeopardy to save himself. But what we read in verses 3 to 7 is that God does something amazing. God himself ensures that the promise will not be derailed. Look what happens in verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you've now taken, for she is a man's wife. And then we read in verse 4, Now Abimelech had not yet approached her. 
So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say she's my sister? And she said he's my brother? In the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. And then God said, yes, I know that you've done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. When Abraham was failing, God steps in and says to Abimelech, which, by the way, the name Abimelech is most likely a title as opposed to a name. It could be a name, but it means the, 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 uh, my father is king. So it, so, so it seems more like a royal title of a king of Gerar at this time. In, in chapter 26, here's what's interesting. You're going to see Abraham and Sarah's son Isaac do the exact same thing that Abraham has done twice. So parents, remember, the way you live does get passed on to your children. I am convinced that we can teach what we know, but ultimately we reproduce who we are. And Isaac does this exact same thing to his wife, Rebecca with a guy named Abimelech. It could be the same guy. It could be a different one because Abimelech seems to be more of a title. But God steps in. God warns Abimelech of his impending judgment. Now, even though Abimelech has stepped into this, not knowing that he had taken another man's wife, don't miss the point that ignorance does not mean we don't sin. It's almost like telling a police officer, I didn't know what the speed limit was. Well, that's fine. It's still, you still broke it. And, Ab and so God comes to Abimelech and says, you are a dead man because you have taken another man's wife. We see a couple things here. Number one, don't miss the fact that when God comes to Abimelech, he comes to him in a way that is different than the way he approaches Abraham. The word that's used here is God comes as, Eli, uh, as Eliohim. In other words, Abimelech recognizes him as a God and sees him as, as the most powerful God, but does not know him in a personal way. He does not refer to him as Yahweh. He refers to him as, as God. And he looks at this God and sees him as powerful and sees now that I'm under the judgment of this God. And God's like, listen, I know you did this in ignorance but you are still walking over a dangerous ground that will lead to your death. And if we look farther down in Genesis chapter 20, we see that God had already brought consequences on his household by causing something to happen in his household to allow uh, intimacy between husband and wife to not be had and the wombs of women were closed. God was already bringing judgment because of the sin of Abimelech, even though he did it in ignorance. And so God comes and says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect Sarah. I'm protecting the promise. I'm protecting Abraham from Abraham. And I'm telling you, Abimelech, you are a dead man. If you don't return her back to the man whose wife she is. The Lord defends the purity of Sarah. He defends her maintaining both the certainty of the promise that the child she will bear will in fact be Abraham's despite his foolishness. But we also see the Lord defends the sanctity of marriage. Notice how Abimelech responds when he says to, to, to Abraham later on, he goes, why have you, Abraham, brought this great sin on my, on my people? What's that great sin? Adultery is that great sin. God cares deeply about marriage, the holiness of it, the sanctity of it, and he is stepping in, protecting Sarah, protecting the promise, and protecting marriage. God, do, and what's interesting, don't miss this. When God says to, to Abimelech, then I want you to go and I want you to give him back, where, where he says, uh, where, where is it? Sorry. Uh, yeah, when he says, now return, now then return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. This is amazing because even as Abraham has totally whiffed it here, like massively whiffed it here, God does not disown him. He still calls him a prophet, which, by the way, 
The first time the word prophet is used in the whole Bible is right here in Genesis chapter 20. And Abraham, who God had called to himself, who God had given promises to, who says, I will fulfill these promises. God has bound himself to Abraham through thick and thin, plenty and in want, <laughs> sickness and in health, right? Like getting it right, getting it wrong. God says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that all my promises to you are protected and I'm never going to disown you. Abimelech, he's still my prophet and he is going to pray for you so that you will be healed. And God provides a path out of judgment for Abimelech. This is a remarkable moment. Even though Abraham puts God's promise in jeopardy, God himself ensures the promise will not be derailed. And then we move on to verse 8, and we see that, Ab or that Abimelech responds immediately where he gathers all of his household together and he tells them what had happened. Don't miss what it says in verse 8. Abimelech rose early in the morning and he called his servants and told them all these things. And the fear of God's judgment had, had, had fallen on the household of Abimelech. He didn't wait. He didn't think about it. He, God came to him and says, you're a dead man. You return this man's wife immediately and let him pray for you so that you can be healed. He gets up early in the morning in response. And then he goes and he, Abimelech confronts Abraham. Don't miss this, guys. Like, there's no way to put it. Abimelech, a non-believing Gentile, looks way better in this story than the patriarch of our faith, Abraham. Abimelech looks like a man of character. He looks like a man of strength. He's responding to God and, and the fear of judgment. And Abraham is shown to be a coward, an excuse maker. And his decisions put a lot of things in jeopardy. It's a, it's a hard thing to wrap your mind around, isn't it? Because we want to look at the heroes of our faith as like, man, they didn't do anything wrong. They did a whole lot wrong. There's only one that's never done anything wrong, and we'll get to that in a minute. Because and Abimelech comes, and he, he like, like comes pretty strong at Abraham. He's like, why did you do this to me? Why did you bring this great sin on my house? What, what is it that you saw in my community that would cause you to treat me like this? And what we see from Abraham and his response is that at the end of the day, the fear of man and the fear of the unknown is what was leading Abraham. It was not God. It was not God's promises. It was not God's faithfulness to him. It was not the word of God that was his bedrock. He looked at everything around him with his eyes. He looked at everything around him and thought, that could kill me, that could kill me, that could kill me. This could be hard on me. Shoot, I'm going to put my wife ahead of me because I want to make sure she gets, you know, let, let her protect me instead of me protecting her. Fear is what's driving everything despite the fact that he had very sure, repeated promises from God. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, we see that God says, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to give you wealth. You will be a blessing to the nations. If we go back to Genesis chapter 15, where God comes back to Abraham once again, and in verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, and he says, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. And once again, three verses later, God, God himself says to Abram, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven. Number the stars if you're able to number them. He said, So shall your offspring be. And then in the very same interaction, if we go down to verse 15, God promises to Abram, As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a, in a good old age. Now take all of that and listen to Abraham's response to Abimelech. 
So Abimelech has said, why did you do this to me? Why did you bring this on my father's or on my house? And in verse 11, Abraham said this. I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she's indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do to me, that at every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. First thing Abraham does is allow his fear to not remember that God said, no, you're going to die at a good old age. Don't worry about I got you, Abraham. You're going to die at a good old age. First thing Abraham does when he comes into Gerar, they're going to kill me. They're totally going to kill me. God says, I'm going to give you a son. I am your shield and your defender. Fear not, Abraham. And Abraham is completely driven by fear. Fear leads him to forgetfulness with the result of faithlessness. Fear leads to forgetfulness with the result of faithlessness. And that led him to to trust in his own schemes and his own ideas rather than standing and walking by faith on the word of God. Even when it didn't make sense to trust the word of God, that would have been a, is a more sure foundation than any scheme or wisdom we could have. His, faithless, his faithlessness had dire consequences for those around him. It put, it put the promise of God in jeopardy. It put his wife in jeopardy. And it put an entire nation in jeopardy. All because he wanted to save his own butt. And because he was too scared to walk by faith. But what we see in verses 14 to 16 is that Abimelech responds correctly. He returns Sarah and he offers extremely generous gifts, which is a very public action that Abimelech did that recognized I messed up. So here's all these gifts to show that you're actually in the right. I was the one in the wrong. I should not have taken Sarah. And he gives an an especially large gift to Sarah as a way to, 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 to publicly pronounce that Sarah is pure and Sarah is untouched. And this also enriches Abraham. And then Abimelech, different from Pharaoh in Egypt, instead of kicking him out of the land... He says, pick whatever part of my land you want and live, with, live among us. The fear of God motivated him to respond with generosity and kindness for the good of Abraham and his people. God had stepped in in an amazing way. And then as we close the passage in verse 17, we see that God does heal Abimelech and his household. God's blessing of the nations is mediated through Abraham, continuing the promise of chapter 12, verse 3. And as Abraham prays for Abimelech, isn't that amazing? What a reversal. Abraham is the one that screwed up. God steps in and intervenes, but it doesn't change the position that Abraham has in the world because of God. And so through him, he blesses and prays for Abimelech and God opens the womb of Abimelech's house, setting what comes next. Isn't it fascinating that we end this passage with the wombs of non-believing Gerarites being able to have children and yet don't miss in the middle of this is God's promise that Sarah will have a son and her womb has been closed for 90 years. Will her womb open? Stay tuned, because we'll read that next week. See, Genesis contains so many important seeds, which the rest of the scriptures grow for us. And in this passage, we see more of those seeds. And I think it's important for us to know them and allow them to shape our lives. And there are a lot of things that we could pull out of here, but there were three that I feel are really important for us to hear. First... God is faithful to his promises and to his people, even when we are not. Guys, don't miss this. 
See, he is the initiator of these promises. He is the sustainer of these promises. He is the finisher of these promises. In fact, Psalm 119 verse 90 says this. If we look at that up there, I think we got it up there, right? Psalm 119, your faithfulness, meaning God, your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. These all generations meaning his promise of salvation and his promises of judgment stand forever. Just as the earth is established, so are all of his promises. God is faithful. Then we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, where this is incredible. The, the church in Corinth was an absolute mess of a people. If you want to read about a congregation, there was, there was incest going on. They're getting drunk at communion. There's lawsuits among believers. I mean, there is just, they're, they're fighting over who's got better spiritual gifts and making other people feel terrible about themselves. Like, this church was a mess. And yet at the beginning, this is what Paul writes to them. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called in the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Even Corinth, that's a total mess. God says that God is faithful to them, that God will sustain them, that God will complete the work in them that he has begun. If we remember in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, which, which Evan read in our call to worship, it says this, is that on there? All right, I got it right here. This is, a, this is a powerful statement that I pray that we remember. It says this, If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. See, God came to Abram and gave him promises that didn't rest on Abraham. They rested on God. When God saves us in Jesus, he gives us promises that he establishes. And he, if he denies his people, then it's like he's denying himself. God is entirely faithful. And so you and I, if we are found in Christ, can rest that it is on his shoulders, not your shoulders, to see it to the end. God steps in and defends his people in ways you can't even imagine. He is your defender. You don't need to defend yourself. He is your defender. God is faithful. Second, the redemption of God's people is secured by the faithfulness of Christ, not by Abraham or anyone else. See, we're not to look at Abraham as if he's our savior. There are lessons to be learned in Abraham's life, for sure. One, this is one of the sad things. That most children's books are just moral examples. Here's Abraham, be like Abraham. Here's David, be like David. No, that's the wrong message. Yes, there are lessons to be learned, but Abraham, like me with the dirty clothes, is inconsistent. He's up and he's down. He's going to get it wrong. He's going to get it right sometimes. But the point of Abraham's life is he was called by God. He is committed to by God. He, God sustains him and God fulfills every promise to him that he gave him. And ultimately, Jesus is the one who comes from Abraham. And who is the one who is perfect in every way, who is unchanging. And Jesus puts himself in harm's way so that we can be redeemed. Jesus is the fulfillment, ultimately, of all the promises that God has given to his people. And Jesus came, and, rather than, and the church is called the bride. And rather than Christ putting the bride out front to save his own skin... 
He stands in the gap for the bride and suffers the punishment due to their sins and dies on a cross on their behalf, rises to new life, showing that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that he is the one in whom salvation is found and that in him his bride is secure. Look to Jesus. He is the true and better prophet. It is his standing in the gap, his intercession that ultimately brings us life and forgiveness. And if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ here today, I pray that Abimelech is an example to you of how to respond. Because apart from Jesus, here's what God says to us. You're a dead man. You're a dead man and my judgment is ready for you. But I've got a prophet who will intercede for you. And if you come to him in faith, I will heal you. I will make you mine. I will hold you and give you secure promises that will last for the end of your life and for all eternity. I pray you respond like Abimelech in that you respond quickly to the call of grace. Because God's hand of mercy is extended, saying, I want to save you. I want to restore you to promise. Will you respond? And thirdly, remember this. Fear leads to forgetfulness. Fear leads to forgetfulness. The scriptures tell us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That he alone we are to fear and see all of life in light of him. And if the fear of the Lord is what's guiding us, then here's what will happen. That will more and more cause us to forget all of the potential things in this life that could cause you harm. God, who's going to defend me? God, who, who's going to provide for me? God, who's going to love me? Who's never going to abandon me? All of the things that we can think of in this life that are terrifying. If God is who we ultimately fear as the author of life, the judge of life, the one who is, the one who will always be, and the one who is to come, and our eyes get fixed more and more on him as the old hymn says, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and faith. Do you hear that God says to his people, fear not? That doesn't mean fear not, but yet hold on to some things to be scared of. It means you have nothing to fear. This might sound really odd what I'm going to say, but I'm going to use this because I do believe it's true. But it kind of, on one hand, I get it, but, but just consider this for me, with me for a minute. During COVID... I was challenged in my own walk, but also very shocked to see Christians who were so terrified of dying. I can't go anywhere because I might die. I can't do anything. I might die. And it's like, wait a minute. Doesn't Corinthians tell us the sting of death is gone because of Jesus? Doesn't Paul say to live is Christ and to die is gain? Does Paul not say, I would rather go be with him than stay here? Like, honestly, let's take the most scary thing that we could possibly imagine in this life, which is death, which is coming for all of us. And Jesus, rising from the grave, says, I've taken that away. You don't need to fear that anymore. Because all those who die in Christ, guess what? Yet shall he live. Do we believe that to the inner core of our being, that death is not something ultimately to be afraid of, but something to be embraced? Because we know that in Christ, the sting of death is gone. And if that has been taken away, what else honestly is there to be afraid of? Honestly, what else is there to be afraid of? 
When our eyes get more and more fixed on the risen Jesus, all of these other things begin to be mitigated as not that threatening. Why do I fear the applause or the disdain of man when I have the acceptance of Almighty God? Why is the applause of people more satisfying to me than knowing that God, as Zephaniah 3.17 says, quiets me with his love and rejoices over me with singing? Oh, God, may I fear you that I forget all of these meaningless things that I think can be so bad for me when I see that Christ has secured for me eternal life. And I belong to the King of kings and the Most High God. What can man do to me? What does Jesus say in Matthew? Don't fear man that can kill the body and do no more. Fear him who can kill the body and cast you into hell. And yet the gospel says when we come to him in Jesus, the fear of judgment, the fear of death, the fear of all the things we can fear are gone. Christian, do you really believe that in such a way that it changes how you live on Monday morning? That it changes the way you look at how you make decisions and how you live your life? These are not meant to be just theological statements that don't impact how we live and how we parent and what we're willing to sacrifice for. Because the fear of man and the unknown leads to, fors to forsaking the Lord. Fear of things in this life will cause us to forget the faithfulness and promises of God, and it will lead to a lack of faith. Fear of things in life will cause us to magnify all the potential things that could go wrong, can make us think our future is uncertain, that we must rely on our own cunning and our smarts to get us through. But the fear of the Lord will cause us to remember his promises and will lead to a growing abundance of faith in him. And as we rest in him, we find that in his presence are pleasures forevermore, that we have a peace that surpasses all all understanding that we can rest though the storms of life hit us though there may be things that are terrifying in this life there are things that you're going to feel a pull to want to claw for but as you rest more and more and more and more in him you will find an inner strength and an inner peace that will transcend whatever is fearful in this world Oh, I pray that we are not a people governed by fear of man and fear of things. Because all that's going away someday. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And in him is hope, is life, is security, is provision, is promise, and is salvation from death and judgment. Whom else shall I fear? Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of your Son. And God, I do pray that we would allow the things of the Scriptures to move deeply into our hearts. That, God, we would not be Christians in name only and live as if none of it's true, but that, God, your word would sink deeply into our hearts, that we would live as if it's all true. God, what a remarkable thing that you've taken away the fear of death. What a remarkable thing that all the approval that we search for in this life is ultimately satisfied when we know that you are God. Look on us with approval because of Jesus God, thank you for being faithful when we're not. Thank you that Christ is our true prophet, is our true Savior, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God, yes, may we learn the lessons we need to learn from the people in, in the scriptures like Abraham. But ultimately, Father, our desire is to fix our eyes on Christ and to be conformed into his image. And we are thankful, God, that when we fail, you are still faithful. And God, help us. 
Help us, God, to fear nothing in this life. But that, God, we would see you as the ancient of days, the almighty creator of heaven and earth, who sits on the throne of heaven in holiness, in splendor, and in magnitude, that in your hands are the keys to death and hell, that in your rich gaze is life and mercy. And may we fear you, reverence you above all things, and to shine that light with security and peace in the midst of the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.